Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I just want to welcome you to the webinar that's entitled Functional Approach to Fertility Optimization. And our guest speaker for today is Taylor Dukes, none other than. So my name is Dr. Lenora Powell, and I'm a medical education specialist in Genova's Atlanta branch, and I will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. So we'd like to all welcome Taylor Dukes. Uh, she is a board certified family nurse practitioner who owns a private practice in Fort Worth, Texas, where she works with patients one on one to get to the root cause of their symptoms. She also owns a wellness center in Fort Worth, Texas that includes everything from IV vitamin therapy, saunas, physical therapy as well. Um, she focuses on taking a root cause approach to her patient's health and uses specialty functional medicine laboratory testing to develop personalized protocols. Taylor was first exposed to the field of functional medicine as a patient when she was really sick, as many of us. Once she healed, she had the opportunity to work for Dr. Amy Myers, a two-time New York Times bestselling author. Taylor is a wife, a mother to an almost two-year-old, and has another precious bundle of joy on the way. She loves helping other mothers in their preconception, pregnancy, and postpartum journeys, and she has had the privilege and opportunity to partner with professional athletes to take their health to the next level and help customize protocols for them. Just reminding everybody that we have many non-invasive urine, saliva, blood spot, stool collection packs that can be shipped directly to your patients for specimen collection at home, and the rest requisition can actually be completed online. So for more information, you can visit your MyGDX account. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the um, role of speaking um, to Taylor. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you for the intro and welcome everyone. I know your time is super valuable. Um, and so thank you for joining us and tuning in today. Um, I we're talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is you know, optimizing mother and father's health prior to conception. Today, obviously, we're talking a lot about mom's health and labs and prenatals and things like this, but a lot of this can be um, applicable to the fathers too when it comes to everything um, lifestyle related. So we'll go ahead and jump in. And we're going to, with this presentation, I'm going to kind of talk about how to optimize the body prior to conception. We're going to focus a lot on nutrition, so macro and micronutrients that are helpful for pregnancy and preconception health. And then I, of course, use the NutriVal and the metabolomics in my practice. Um, and we'll kind of get into a little bit more about certain nutrient deficiencies that can affect, you know, preconception health and why they are um, important to sustain pregnancy as well. So we'll go to the next slide. And um, it's super important to prepare a healthy seed and healthy soil. And I think a lot of us have, you know, heard this you know, phrase or whatever, but we're going to kind of dig into a little bit more about what that means, um, especially clinically. So infertility is increasing. I think, you know, whether you work with infertility patients or not, you probably hear about it among your circles or colleagues or, you know, even in your own personal life. Um, so, you know, we also know that reproductive technology is increasing and it can be super helpful um, in certain situations. However, my heart and how I kind of approach my practice is to kind of do everything that we can in our power to optimize um, mother's health prior to conception. And so I think one of the things that's really overlooked and undervalued is, you know, looking at the couple together um, and screening them for preconception health and evaluating nutrition, getting on a prenatal at the correct time um, and things like that. So with that being said, I'm really passionate about optimizing fertility with nutrition. We'll get into macros and micros to prioritize. Um, how to optimize the body, you know, we'll be talking about certain detox protocols, why that's important, and then kind of how soon to get on a prenatal. There are lots of different thoughts and questions, but I'm really passionate about optimizing nutrient levels that can help support fertility as well as, you know, maintain mom throughout pregnancy and help support postpartum as well. And then, um, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes when people are having issues with, with fertility, then they'll start wondering about nutrition, but I am really passionate about being proactive about that. So moving right along, we're gonna talk about why um, mother's health is so important. And 
you know, when, when you're born and you're a female, you're born with all the eggs that you'll ever have. So unlike men, where they produce sperm throughout their life, um, women are born with all of the eggs that they will ever have. Of course, they're immature at that time, um, but they can't really create more down the road. And so we're born with a lot, over a million actually, most people. Um, but by the time puberty hits, we have an average of 400,000, um, losing about 1,000 possible eggs with every cycle. So depending on your age and the number of stressors the body has been exposed to over the years, you know, the stressors can have a significant impact on those eggs, reducing not only the quantity, but of course, quality, which is what's super important. Um, so just like with the rest of the cells in our body, eggs can become damaged over time from exposure of internal or external stressors. Some of these things we can control and do our best. Some of them are a little bit out of our control, but these things could be toxins, chemicals, stress levels, or even just not enough nutrients um, to help preserve and protect the quality of those eggs. And so, you know, with time, your cells may get disrupted and not have the correct vitamins and minerals to successfully play out their role. Um, and so again, I can't emphasize enough the mother's health and how it influences baby's health in numerous ways. Um, you know, I think it's really important that mom's eating not only enough of the right foods, um, but also, you know, we always talk about, it's not just what you eat, it's what you digest and absorb. And so sometimes going a little bit further of like, why is mom so depleted of nutrients? And sometimes, you know, that goes back to looking at the gut and making sure that absorption is happening and things like that. Um, Plus, you know, we talk about mom's health and, and preparing her body for, you know, a healthy pregnancy and sustaining pregnancy. Um, but we also have to talk about the baby and how the baby will be grabbing all of the vitamins and minerals that it can and um, just want to make sure that there's enough available nutrients, you know, to energize and take care of essential fact functions for baby as well. Um, and then something that Lenore presented on last month's presentation was kind of postnatal um, nutrients. And so, you know, everything that you do preconception and throughout your pregnancy will help support a healthy postpartum um, as well. And so uh, you just want to make sure that your patients are giving their babies, you know, healthy bacteria to boost when they enter into this world, um, you know, as far as like nutrition for mom's diet, of course, making sure mom's gut is intact, um, and things like that. So um, we will go ahead and jump into kind of some macros and micros to prioritize. Um, so I'm really passionate about, you know, I know people are going to have different, this is kind of hard to talk about nutrition because there's no one size fits all approach. So I'm going to talk about things that, you know, I value and things that are important. But of course, every patient is has individual needs and you have to, that's where you can use testing to determine what they need more of or fit their lifestyle if they're vegan or vegetarian. So I'll kind of talk about this in general. Um, but if they're going to be eating protein, of course, I want to emphasize that it's high quality protein. Um, so it's important to, you know, stock the fridge with pasture raised, grass fed, wild caught salmon when appropriate. Um, and they don't contain any added antibiotics or hormones or pesticides or any other nasty, you know, gut damaging chemicals, especially when it comes to when we talk about the hormones and estrogen dominance and things like that. Um, so I also encourage, you know, people to eat eggs that are local and, um, you know, organic fed meat, especially organ meat, you know, the liver, liver meat can be really, really helpful um, and nutrient dense for a number of reasons, but also can help boost iron reserves and things like that. But the main thing I want to emphasize is just if people are eating, you know, protein or meat sources, um, just that the quality and the sourcing really do matter. Um, and then also something that I feel like a lot of trendy diets are forgetting about healthy sources of fiber. And so you know, the average American gets 14 grams per day and our ancestors actually got around 100 grams per day. So that's a huge gap. And just even adding in two tablespoons of ground flaxseed to meals, you know, or smoothies or whatever that looks like um, can help not only with fiber, but help maintain estrogen levels. Um, and so other healthy sources of fiber include apples, prunes, chia seeds, um, lentils, chickpeas, things like that. 
And then another really important thing to emphasize are folate rich foods. So of course, you know, we'll get into talking about prenatal vitamins and nutrients and things like that. Um, but I also don't want to miss all of the nutrient dense foods that we can be consuming, um, especially folate. So, you know, folate is extremely important in baby's development. I think even in the functional medicine world, you know, we talk a lot about all of these things, but this is very, you know, commonly accepted even in the conventional setting. Um, and this is really important during the first three to four weeks of pregnancy. It can help with proper neural tube and spine development of baby and help prevent congenital disabilities. So, you know, what are sources of that? Um, liver, spinach, asparagus, broccoli, um, and these are things to incorporate prior to conception, but also especially during that first trimester, um, you know, if mama can get it in. So other things to emphasize are, I would say plant-based protein. You know, don't think I'm leaving out plant-based protein. I know some people tend to steer more towards a vegetarian, vegan diet. So this is important that if you do work with patients that are avoiding you know, animal meat or seafood, that they are getting adequate protein sources. Um, so things like lentils, chickpeas, beans, nuts, seeds, of course, quinoa. Um, these are great to incorporate into a grain bowl or on top of a big salad or, of course, hummus, things like that. Um, and again, y'all, this is not specific nutrient advice for every single mom conceiving. This is where you as clinicians get to decide what is best for your patient and depending on maybe some sensitivities or, you know, underlying conditions or things like that. Um, and then something else that is super important, we'll kind of get into the lab aspect, but I find and I work with a lot of women, um, menstruating women that are iron deficient. And so another important thing to incorporate are iron rich foods, um, especially if mama's anemic. So women, you know, need to make sure they have enough iron for their red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout the body. Um, and sources of this would include things like organ meats, um, pumpkin seeds, white beans, lentils, spinach, um, things like that to increase iron supply. And of course, too, like, it's not just eating those things, it also goes back to digestion and absorption. And that's where, you know, really optimizing gut health prior to conception. Um, can be really, really helpful. And then a couple other things that I also want to emphasize um, are tons of healthy fats. That includes, you know, EPA, DHA, omega-3s. Um, so sources of that are things like wild-caught salmon, sardines, avocado. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of kind of keeping these main staples in your cabinet because they're great sources of healthy fats. So things like Flax seeds, chia seeds, walnut, pumpkin seeds, um, organic extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, um, things like that. I can't emphasize the importance enough of healthy fats prior to conception to help just support hormones, but also for baby during pregnancy. Um, and then magnesium, one of my favorite things in the world. But, um, you know, in a lot of people supplement with magnesium, I find a lot of women are deficient based off of, you know, some Genova nutrient testing that I use. We'll get into that. Um, but, of course, consuming magnesium-rich foods. So, you know, it's needed in over 300 biochemical reactions in the body, including detox. It can help with sleep, mood stability, especially um, moms during pregnancy as well, like restless legs, cramps, things like that. So always keep that on the forefront of your mind. Um, throughout pregnancy, but easy ways to increase magnesium in the diet is just to sprinkle some pumpkin seeds or Brazil nuts um, on salads or meals, eating quinoa, spinach, throwing that in smoothies, um, all great ways to incorporate sources of healthy magnesium in the diet. And then so those are kind of the macros and micronutrients, which of course, like nutrition is foundational and key and I'm not getting into a bunch of the things to avoid that are inflammatory. I think we as clinicians, um, you know, I'll get into a little bit of that, but can discern what that looks like for our patients. But um, we'll talk about other ways to optimize the body prior to conception. Of course, a lot of this is going to be relevant throughout pregnancy. Um, but, you know, this, of course, is more about preconception. So uh, really passionate about organic foods, you know, 
at a minimum, they should buy organic foods that are on the EWG dirty dozen list right there. So they update this list every year. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Um, and I get it, you know, some patients are on a budget and we really have to work with them and they're choosing to invest with us and do testing and get on high quality prenatals. And so, you know, if your patient has the means to, to shop all organic and locally and seasonally and all of that, great. But another way that you can help encourage them is, you know, the dirty 12 are the ones that are most highly sprayed with pesticides and have, um, you know, they're just contaminated produce with pesticide residue on them. So I would have them buy produce that isn't organic um, if they have to like, you know, have a deal breaker there. The clean 15 on the right, those are the things that are less contaminated. So, um, you know, it's like, obviously the dirty 12, you wanna prioritize buying those organic. And then if you had to choose, you know, which ones to not buy organic, for example, things like avocados, um, you know, you don't have to worry about as much. Um, also something that's super important is eating foods that are in season. So eating with the seasons helps with microbial diversity and eating foods based on seasonality will also allow the gut to kind of rest from other foods and of course reducing the risk for food sensitivities. You know, I think especially a lot of people or maybe this is my practice, I see people that get into healthy foods and meal plan and meal prep but they're eating the same thing over and over because they know they like it, they know how to prepare it, um, but I think it's really important that we kind of promote that microbial diversity. And um, so you can recommend that your patients check out any like community supported agriculture programs, like they have CSA boxes and options in their area. Of course, I personally love shopping at our local farmer's market. It's, you know, just a way to encourage more variety. Sometimes you'll find cheaper prices and lower pesticide exposure. Um, and then also uh, aiming for a variety of colorful fruits and veggies. So each color, you know, we know we say eat the rainbow and things like that, but each color contains specific phytonutrients that deliver, you know, benefits to your organs and bodily processes, and they can affect everything from your immune system, you know, to your antioxidant reserve. They can have anti-inflammatory benefits and so much more. And um, yeah, I just think we, can, we as clinicians should continue to encourage our patients to make their plates as colorful as possible with as many whole foods as possible. Um, and again, just kind of changing up that diversity. So I briefly alluded to um, anti-inflammatory foods and I think inflammation is a very big buzzword and it's at the root of a lot of things, but practically, you know, what does that mean and look like? And again, each patient is gonna be different. For example, someone with an autoimmune disease might be heavily inf um, impacted by nightshades, you know? So this is where we really have to consider that bio-individuality. Um, but inflammation can damage cells and magnify health issues or things that are already at play. And, you know, that inflammation or the chronic systemic inflammation can really uh, impact fertility and pregnancy. Um, so, you know, also anti-inflammatory diets can relieve some symptoms of two of the most common causes of female infertility, which, as we know, are endometriosis and PCOS. And so, you know, by directly reducing that inflammation via nutrition can help the immune system, can help hormones, um, just kind of help calm down that systemic inflammation. Um, so things that I like to add in personally um, to my food, my baby's food, is adding in things like turmeric and ginger. I like to make fresh tea with those, like the actual roots. But of course, just cooking with this organic spice is a great is a great way um, to incorporate that as well. And so, green leafy vegetables, berries have tons of antioxidants. Wild caught salmon, um, extra virgin olive oil on salads, you know, beets. All of those things can help. Um, combat inflammation in the body. Something else that's super important to consider is low glycemic index foods. Um, and of course, we had talked about increasing fiber and how most of our patients or just most of the population doesn't get enough dietary fiber. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that low glycemic index diets can reduce the risk of, you know, large for gestational age infants and 
Of course, dietary fiber can be really helpful and is associated with improved pregnancy outcomes as well, um, especially when it comes to the microbiome. And then there's also, you know, research about reducing preeclampsia, um, dyslipidemia, things like that in pregnancy. And then something that's super important, I mean, this is important for all patients, right? But this is just an emphasis on um, preconception and pregnancy, but hydration is so important and, you know, not just drinking water, but making sure it's filtered water. Um, so, you know, I think I recommend my patients, my clients get a stainless steel water bottle or glass, something they can fill up throughout the day instead of just grabbing plastic water bottles and like, I get it. It's life. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do and some water is better than none. Um, but I think it's really easy just to continually be exposed to plastics and chemicals um, when there are better options. And so I, of course, you know, always encourage patients to fill up their water bottles with filtered water from a high quality water filter when they have access um, to reduce their toxic load as much as possible. Um, you know, some water sources are loaded with contaminants and even microplastics, which actually have been found in newborns, which is kind of concerning. Um, but coming from a preconception standpoint, you know, we talk about endocrine disruptors and the amount of chemicals that we're exposed to. So anyway, you can tell I'm passionate about clean water. <laughs> um, you know, Berkey water filters, aqua saunas, whole house filtration systems are great you know, if you have the means and, and the ability to do that, just because so much of our body is compromised of, or, you know, of water. And so making sure that it's good and clean water. Um, and this might seem really obvious, but I feel like a lot of these things get overlooked. Um, so replacing plastic containers, I've kind of alluded to this, but prenatal exposure to BPA, phthalate, so many chemicals can be associated with either fetal growth restriction or small for gestational age babies, um, along with, you know, like I've said, hormone imbalances, which can make it harder to conceive. And so swapping out plastics with glass or stainless steel um, containers, obviously not microwaving those things, things like that um, can be really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, I'm just a big fan of focusing on eating as many whole colorful foods as possible because when you do this, you don't have other room for those crappy fake foods that are filled with harmful ingredients. And um, I really am a big fan of encouraging my patients and I do this myself to just kind of shop the perimeter of the grocery store and kind of avoid as much packaged stuff as possible. So we talked a lot about the foods um, that you should emphasize or eat prior to conception. But I think, you know, once mama's pregnant, um, there are certain foods to stay away from during pregnancy. This, you know, we all might have our different opinions on this. And I will say, I, I go to midwives myself personally, and I can't speak for every OBGYN or midwife, but I feel like most people are handed a list of things that they should avoid, the very obvious things. Um, but there is, you know, a lot of gray area and this is where we as functional clinicians can kind of say hey like let's take it a step further and let's avoid food dyes let's not just talk about the mercury and tuna things like that so i'll kind of just hit on these um, limit caffeine and alcohol intake or avoid altogether of course diet teas it has a lot of chemicals like aspartame things like that um, i alluded to the dirty dozen which are the foods that you know, are tested and usually contain more pesticide residue. Um, of course, lunch meats, conventionally raised animal products, food dyes, that's really important. And a lot of these, you know, this is just going to be things I recommend in general anyway, but especially during pregnancy. Um, so kind of avoiding those highly processed, refined foods, of course, avoiding trans fat, hydrogenated oils, refined vegetable oils. Um, Definitely encourage patients to avoid sodas just because that can heavily affect blood sugar, which affects baby and then puts mom at risk for, of course, things like gestational diabetes. And um, I also really, really encourage people to stay away from diet sodas just because they don't have as many calories or sugar. They are chemical storms in a little can that I think actually are probably arguably worse than sugar itself. Um, and then refined sugar, you know, we talked about aspartame that can be in diet teas, diet sodas, 
Um, and this is recognized by kind of a lot of mainstream OBGYNs and midwives. They say, hey, like, of course, avoid tuna because it's raw, like sushi, um, but minimize or avoid even canned tuna or cooked tuna because of the mercury content. Um, so anyway, I'm really, you know, when you do eat seafood, because it does have healthy, you know, benefits, really make sure that you're getting it from a high quality source, wild caught, you know, there are brands that test for heavy metals, things like that. So we talked a lot about foods to kind of emphasize, foods to stay away from. Um, and I also, this is something that gets so overlooked and I can't tell you all enough how much I see stress impact fertility, pregnancy, of course, postpartum. It is a crazy stressful, beautiful time, um, but really, really focusing on stress. And like Lenore had alluded to, I, uh, I was Amy Meyer's nurse for years at her practice in Austin. And we saw a lot of autoimmune patients and I can't tell y'all how often people would come in or start experiencing symptoms of an autoimmune disease after a stressful event, um, whether it was a loss of a job, a loss of a loved one, an accident. Um, some things were out of their control, but you can see that is when I really, really realized the like how important stress was and how much it affected our body. And so kind of a side tangent, but I just, I think we cannot overlook this aspect. You can eat all the healthy food in the world and exercise and have filtered water and clean air. But, you know, if you're not working on your nervous system and, and getting into that parasympathetic state and reducing cortisol, you know, all of those things are great that you're doing, but you just can't forget this. And so Clearly, I'm really passionate about it, um, but chronic stress causes cortisol to rise and obviously continue to stay elevated, and so this can lead to an imbalance in other hormones or a disruption in the HPA access, and this HPA process usually has a negative feedback loop, which most of us know and can turn off this fight or flight mode. Um, we want it to be more in the rest and digest mode. However, when we have a disrupted HPA access, which I, a lot of my patients do, I don't want to speak for y'alls, it can kind of keep them running in fight or flight state long term. And I just, our bodies were not created or designed to be in that state long term. And so, especially with just our fast paced society, you know, I think everything is so normalized about this fight or flight and hustle bustle. Um, but of course, we know as clinicians that this elevated cortisol can cause havoc on other hormones, especially sex hormones. So when those are imbalanced, it can impact the reproductive system, fertility, um, you know, even offspring. And so one study actually demonstrated a connection between stress and ovulation. And I found this super interesting, um, but it showed that women who felt high levels of stress during ovulation were actually 40% less likely to get pregnant during that month compared to other less stressful months. So pretty interesting research out there and, and, you know, just comparing like what that looks like when you're in seasons of stress. And I think, you know, sometimes there are things that are unavoidable. Like I totally understand that unforeseen circumstances, a diagnosis of a loved one. Um, but even though if we are under stress, I think really, I personally try to implement this in my own life, but also with patients is making sure that there are outlets to kind of reset the nervous system, whatever that looks like. Some people like acupuncture, some people need to meditate, you know, but finding what that looks like um, for that person is super, super important prior to conception, um, especially if they're experiencing infertility, but then of course, once they are pregnant as well. So um, this, you know, just alludes a little bit more to stress when the HPA axis is activated by stressors, it can affect fertility. Um, through a multitude of things, you know, I just kind of listed them out here and you guys can all reference it. Um, but obviously it can affect progesterone levels and um, chronically high levels of cortisol can lead to lower levels of progesterone um, because they're both kind of competing for that same precursor or they have the same precursor. And so usually the body will choose to make cortisol for survival over progesterone, which of course, we know can affect the ability to conceive and also the ability to kind of sustain a pregnancy. Um, so, you know, the FSH, LH ratio, it can lower oocyte capability, um, reduce the number of sites that implantation can occur in the uterus. And then one thing I want to talk about, and I'll share a case study with y'all if you hang with us till the end, 
Um, but it, you know, we talk about the HPA access, we talk about the thyroid, but as we all know, the body's interconnected. And so, you know, stress can really impact thyroid levels. And I see this all the time in my practice and high cortisol levels also affect, you know, the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. And so since optimal thyroid function is needed, not only fertility, for fertility, but also throughout pregnancy, um, this negative impact on the active form of T3 can really influence conception rates and then, of course, the ability to sustain a pregnancy. Um, so that's something that I actually see a lot of patients come to me and they've done the whole IVF workout up. They've done IUI transfers. They might be on a low dose of Synthroid, um, but just because they're on medication doesn't mean their levels are optimal. And then just by tweaking, you know, of course, we're looking at multiple things, but just tweaking their thyroid function alone can help mom sustain pregnancy. Um, but of course, you know, that's with medication. Some people need it, but really focusing on stress to make sure it's optimal. So like I alluded to, everyone, you know, reduces stress in different ways. And so um, I know we're not like counselors all the time. Some of us probably do more stress counseling, but just encourage your patients to reduce their stress by incorporating whatever it is into their weekly or daily routine that they enjoy and that's effective for them. Um, you know, and I know we can't eliminate all the stress from our lives, but we can certainly learn how to manage it instead of letting it bottle up inside or covering it up with unhealthy practices or just ignoring it and normalizing it. And so just, you know, again, learning how to process stress, encouraging them to have those outlets, seek counseling when necessary, focus on deep breathing, journaling, meditation, prayer, yoga, whatever that looks like. Um, and again, we, we can only help encourage and facilitate that, but a lot of it happens, um, you know, on the patients, they have to make the choice. We can empower them and do all the lab testing and equip them with the protocols, but you know, let's not forget the importance of that. Um, so moving right along, we're gonna kind of get into some micronutrients that are important, um, especially those that I believe should be in a prenatal. We all might have different opinions, but I'll kind of get into that. Um, but the World Health Organization estimates that around 2 billion people are actually deficient in micronutrients. So with women being at particular risk because of, of course, menstruation, high metabolic demands of pregnancy. So in my opinion, it's important to not only get on a prenatal, prenatal but to identify um, if other necessary supplementation is needed. And this is kind of where I use testing to help me determine, hey, do we need to supplement other, you know, minerals, vitamins, things like that prior to conception, or of course, support mom throughout pregnancy as well. So a question that I get all the time is, okay, if I'm thinking about starting a family soon, when should I get on a prenatal? So in my opinion, ideally patients should start preparing their body, not just with the prenatal, but detox, focusing on healthy choices, things like that. I would say three to six months prior to conception, um, this also in my practice looks like making sure their gut's good because, you know, I personally don't treat a lot of dysbiosis or fungal overgrowth or parasites or do any targeted detox during pregnancy. And so this is where, um, you know, I personally will do some, some detoxes before pregnancy myself. I've done it. Uh, this is, I'm only pregnant with my second, but <laughs> with both boys, I really focused on some specific targeted detox prior to conception. Um, and again, just using this opportunity three to six months ahead of time to prepare the body because, you know, once you are pregnant, there are certain things that you can't detox. There are certain things that you can't treat, um, in my opinion. So also real life scenario, like we can't always plan, right? And so if your patient just finds out they're pregnant, of course, can't go back in time, can't change anything. But one thing you can do is encourage them to be on a really high quality prenatal. Um, and we'll kind of get into what does that look like? And what is my opinion of a um, high quality prenatal? So, you know, I think even if our patients are eating the best foods, staying away from the, for the worst foods, you know, taking a high quality prenatal, in my opinion, is still highly recommended and encouraged and something that I personally do um, just because it allows, you know, 
the mom's body and their baby to have an excess of optimal nutrients for growth, for health. And, you know, a lot of the things that I'm passionate about is it's not just preconception and conceiving and pregnancy. It's also things that you do three to six months ahead of time, you know, before conceiving is also going to affect baby's health as well as mom's postpartum. And so, you know, I've worked with patients that haven't, they had a couple kids and they had tons of gut issues and fungal overgrowth and, you know, their kids have eczema. And then we worked on their health and kind of balancing things and doing gut testing and nutrient testing. And they're like, oh my gosh, my third baby's the healthiest. And so um, I do see it all the time that mom's microbiome and mom's health can affect baby. Um, so I also know there are so many prenatals on the market and there's so much marketing towards moms and Patients can get super overwhelmed and maybe some of y'all clinicians are like, I don't know which one to trust or what's the best. And so there, there are good ones out there. Um, but when choosing the right prenatal, you know, you as the provider, you want to give the best recommendations. And so um, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit more about some of these specific nutrients in prenatals. And of course, finding a really high quality prenatal vitamin. So I always educate my patients and, you know, on social media and things like that to never ever buy supplements, especially prenatals off of Amazon. It's just, even if it looks like it's the brand that we use in practice, it's just not regulated. It could be contaminated. It could be sitting in an old warehouse. It could be expired and they relabeled it. You know, there's just lots of things that are unregulated and uncontrolled. And so I always recommend that my patients um, should purchase from high quality brands that are third party tested and verified. Um, and, you know, that, of course, comes with making sure that the prenatals are free of impurities of things like heavy metals, allergens, fillers, chemicals, additives, things like that. And then I'm sure a lot of y'all are familiar, but I had referenced the GMP certified label. It's just it's awarded to only companies that meet a high level of compliance with organizations, GMP standard, um, and they're verified through comprehensive third party inspections of facilities and things like that. Um, so we'll kind of get into, I'm going to kind of go down this list. Um, Y'all bear with me. This is kind of a long list, um, but I'm just going to talk about the, what should the prenatal contain? Um, and again, this is not for everybody. For example, if someone had excess iron, you might want to choose a prenatal that doesn't have iron, but I'm going to talk about um, just kind of all these different specific nutrients and how they can be helpful for preconception, but also during pregnancy. So um, I am very passionate about methylfolate, not folic acid, you know, dietary supplementation with folate around the time of conception has been known to reduce the risk of neural tube defects um, in the offspring. And uh, yeah, I'm just a huge fan of methylfolate because this form has greater, greater bioavailability than the synthetic folate and things like that. Um, and so even if someone was taking folic acid, their body may not be able to use it effectively. So definitely looking for the methylated form or just folate. Um, so vitamin E, this protects eggs against free radicals. Um, this is because the follicle that surrounds the egg is full of this antioxidant. And so it can actually protect the egg from oxidative damage by building kind of like a barrier around it. Um, so not only can be helpful for egg quality, but can also increase cervical mucus, um, which can help sperm stay alive longer <laughs> to, of course, reach and fertilize the egg. Um, choline. So 90 to 95% of women don't consume enough choline. Um, I kind of like to aim for around 450 milligrams a day. So it's an essential micronutrient needed for proper brain and spinal cord development. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really passionate about this. And it has tons of amazing benefits for mothers and babies. Um, and I don't think it's included in enough prenatals. So this is something I always encourage patients to look for. Um, and actually some studies have shown that 18 month old infants actually have better cognitive scores with mothers who had higher plasma free choline levels at 16 weeks of pregnancy. So um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely helpful and can be um, supportive for a lot of different processes throughout pregnancy and for baby. So like I had alluded to, iron is not for everybody. I have some patients that have had high ferritins and you know, you can get into all of the causes or reasons for that, not just ferritin, like a, you know, inflammation, but also iron reserves. Um, and so this can be, if 
mom is deficient or just for a general prenatal, someone that's not high in iron, um, you know, there's certain forms of iron that can be easier on the stomach, especially if someone gets nauseous from taking, you know, iron pills, constipated, things like that. Um, but it is really essential for producing red blood cells, you know, that can carry oxygen throughout the body. And pregnant women are much more susceptible to iron deficiency since our blood volume doubles. Um, and so this is one of those that, you know, it's, I actually monitor this throughout pregnancy because I see a lot of moms become anemic towards the end. Um, but again, this is something that clinically you can make sure their iron levels are optimized prior to getting pregnant so they have a little bit more of that iron reserve built up. Um, moving right along, uh, zinc. So zinc is important for keeping eggs healthy. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies and research that show that zinc deficiencies are associated with it taking longer time for people to get pregnant. Of course, that's one factor, but there is research that supports that. There are lots of other factors as well. Um, and then, of course, if it's going to contain B vitamins, I like the methylated form, which gives the body the most active form of B vitamins. And they're needed for numerous processes in the body and for preventing birth de defects, can help mom with energy, um, having optimal levels of B vitamins, especially B6 before preconception, may help reduce nausea, especially during that first trimester. Um, and something that I find, because I usually track, I'm doing nutrient testing through Genova on most of my patients, um, whether they're professional athletes or moms wanting to conceive or someone with autoimmunity, but I feel like I could have my own little case studies, but moms that are really deficient in B6, um, if you look at the nutrient test, they're kind of in the red section. Um, I actually find that they are more prone towards pregnancy nausea. So again, optimizing those B6 levels, supplementing as appropriate during pregnancy can kind of help curve that nausea. Um, vitamin A, I like it in the form of beta carotene. So, you know, vitamin A deficiency is one of the main causes of preventable blindness and, and things like that. It can also positively affect the immune system as well as baby skin and eye development. Um, and vitamin A also helps with bone development. So, you know, there are certain amounts of vitamin A um, can be really, really helpful for even things like baby's teeth and hair developing normally. Um, and then moving right along, uh, let's see. Copper. So this helps with antioxidant production and it's, you know, essential for forming red blood cells and it helps, you know, form the baby's heart, blood vessels, as well as skeletal and nervous system. So uh, again, this is getting into the nitty gritty, but you can just reference this and I'm sure a lot of you already do um, just to make sure that that the prenatals contain this and then but this just goes into a little bit more about why and the importance. And so Vitamin C, this helps your body make progesterone, which we know is super helpful and needed to maintain pregnancy. Um, you know, and this can be really helpful for women who struggle with luteal phase defects and low progesterone even prior to conception. Um, calcium, we know that that's needed to support healthy bones and teeth for the mother and baby. And you wanna prepare your body for, of course, a tiny growing human and skeleton. And so it's vital to have enough calcium stored up. Um, and then DHA, you know, this is an omega-3 fatty acid that supports so many different parts of baby's health from brain to eyes to nervous system development. Um, there are actually some research that shows that DHA may prevent preterm labor. So, um, and also it can help kind of support postpartum, new, uh, postpartum mood in new mothers. So definitely, I usually have my patients continue prenatals uh, postpartum or get on specific supplements postpartum to help with milk supply as well as um, mood. So here are um, some things that are recommended supplements for egg quality. Um, you know, I know we're not, this, this presentation isn't focused on infertility. Um, so I'll kind of just briefly touch on these, but these are things that can help with egg quality. Um, I'll just kind of hit on a few, but glutathione is one of the most powerful antioxidants produced by the body. And so it keeps our cells healthy. It helps them fight off free radicals and combat, combat oxidative stress. And so, you know, when we're constantly exposing ourselves to toxins day in and day out, which, you know, it's hard to avoid in today's society, um, but we can easily use up our glutathione stores, leaving our cells and our eggs unprotected. And so, it's important to keep up those levels high, supplement as appropriate, 
Um, I, of course, use some markers on Genova's testing to help me know when to um, use more of that. And acetylcysteine can help so many processes in the body with fertility being one of them. Uh, it can promote healthy egg quality. Um, you know, it can help the body actually, it's a precursor for making glutathione. And so sometimes just providing the body with some precursors like NAC can help the body um, make glutathione. CoQ10, I actually see that a lot of my patients, I don't wanna speak for all conventional fertility doctors, um, but I will see that, you know, this is pre pretty widely accepted that CoQ10 can be helpful for mom and dad's health. And so it helps to support the cell's mitochondria, um, things like that, but can also help egg quality and sperm quality. So I will, it's not uncommon for me to have fertility patients come to me that are already on CoQ10. Um, DHEA, you know, this is controversial of when to do this, when to not, when to stop. You have to make that decision as a clinician, um, but it can be a powerful hormone that can help increase AMH levels, um, which, you know, doctors use to measure and, and look at, you know, ovarian reserve and aging. Of course, fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids, reference that a few times, and then um, vitamin C. And there's actually studies that show um, that for women who consume vitamin C, whether that's in supplement form or dietary form, they could actually increase their fertility. So yeah, those are kind of recommended supplements for egg quality. They're not going to be harmful necessarily. Um, you got to make that decision yourself as a clinician, but these kind of can be helpful for fertility type protocols. So I'm really, really passionate about detoxing before pregnancy. Um, we live in a world today where toxins are everywhere in our beauty products, clothes, workplaces, food, household cleaners, even in our backyards, right? So because toxins can impact bodily processes and even transfer to an unborn baby, it's really important to detox before pregnancy occurs. Um, so, you know, toxins can increase infertility. There's actually certain chemicals that can actually affect your chances of conceiving or miscarrying. Um, so I know that it's really hard and we all like to think that once it's time to get pregnant, you know, that next month you'll get a positive pregnancy tester in one to two months. However, for many women, this isn't the case. And one of the reasons for the rise in infertility rates could be from environmental toxin exposure. Um, so, you know, there's lots of products and chemicals you know, including BPA, PCBs, DDT, glyphosate, just to name a few. And one study actually showed that women who had higher pesticide exposure to glyphosate actually had 39% higher um, infertility rates. And so, again, I don't think this is the only cause or contributor, but it's something that we can definitely um, educate our patients about and, you know, really encourage them to clean up their, their lives as much as possible. Um, so, and yeah, I get it. Like we may never be able to completely eliminate toxins from our surroundings, but I think when you become aware of where toxins are coming from, we can certainly do our best to lessen our toxic burden. Um, and I know a lot of patients, like everyone has different patients that they work with. The patient population that I serve, they already do all the non-toxic things. They've already tried the protocols, the cleanses. Um, but, you know, if it's someone that still uses conventional laundry detergent. I just encourage them to start somewhere, whether that's cleaning up the household cleaning products. I personally use Branch Basics at my home and in my office, and it's foolproof. It's so easy. It's a concentrate. It's amazing. Um, you know, but just making it very, it doesn't have to happen all at once, but small daily choices do add up. Um, and then of course, targeted detoxes before pregnancy, you know, every patient, whether they have heavy metal toxicity or they just have symptoms that like remind you that they're toxic, just like headaches and period cramps and things like that. That might be a good time to consider, you know, detoxing through nutrition, supplement, or more um, targeted things. So um, yeah, how to detox during preconception. I kind of talked about this. We can't forget about some of the basics like household and cleaning products, organic fruits and vegetables, you know, eating and drinking, you know, drinking clean water and, and um, you know, the air that we breathe can play a role. And so just kind of tackling that one at a time and you as the provider can assess, you know, what would be most valuable to your patient. Um, and then of course, supporting the liver, it plays a huge role in the detoxification process and um, optimal detoxification is really essential in preparing the body for conception. And so 
not only, you know, we're, I'm talking about a lot of toxins and getting those out of the body proper, you know, but we also want to help support healthy hormone balance, like extra excess estrogen levels and things like that. Um, so here's some practical things that you can always reference, like exercising regularly, stress, relief, stress relief, like I said earlier. Um, I think people forget that having a bowel movement every day is a form of detox. And so, you know, there's some helpful ways to support the liver through detoxification um, and not forgetting about stress relief. <laughs> and then these are labs that I don't do this on every single patient. I just wanted to give you guys some tangible things to reference. Um, this could look like a pregnancy panel for a patient, you know. Um, so vitamin D levels, RBC, magnesium. I usually am checking nutrients through Genova's testing, to be honest. But, you know, CBC, CMP, hemoglobin A1C to look at their blood sugar picture, um, you know. And then, of course, some patients that have had multiple miscarriages, I'll ch check serum, progesterone, HCG. Um, I will prescribe or supplement as needed with that progesterone when necessary, just pinning the patient's history. Of course, like I said, iron panel with ferritin prior to conception is ideal, but if they're pregnant and you're like, let's just start somewhere doing it at the beginning of pregnancy. And then of course, a full thyroid panel. So I know we're kind of getting to the end of time here, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little brief clinical case study. And so um, I get patients that come to me that just want to be the healthiest they can be prior to conception. They're like, I'm going to try in the next six to eight months. And I'm like, wow, mom, you're so prepared. This is amazing. But I also get a lot of people that have failed IVF and IUI and, um, you know, they weren't open to changing their lifestyle, but it's kind of their last ditch effort. And so with this specific patient, she was a 28-year-old female. She had a known diagnosis of Hashimoto's. She was actually on levothyroxine, had worked with the endocrinologist, fertility doctors. Um, had She actually worked with an OBGYN, but she was in the process of consulting fertility as well as working with me. So she had several miscarriages. Um, and so I basically just said, hey, you're still young. I know you want to have this baby, and it's not in my timing. Um, but if you can just give me a little bit of time to help prepare your body, I would love to do a stool test. She did have bloating, constipation. So there were things indicating issues. Um, and of course, we did nutrient testing plus bl basic blood work labs. And my goal with her, I said, you can work with fertility if you choose to go that route. But if you want to work with me, I, I need like three to six months and let's just make your, your chance of conceiving um, the best as possible. And so we continued to monitor her levels throughout pregnancy, which means, yes, she did get pregnant and um, she was able to sustain the pregnancy. And so, of course, you can see I use the Genova nutrient test. It's hard to see on this page and the next page the markers um, up close and personal. But of course, this is a test. If you've seen me ever share on Instagram or educate or talk about, you know, on podcasts, I always use uh, the NutriVal or metabolomics to kind of assess nutrient status where we can you know, improve things. It's not just putting them on a prenatal. For me, it's like, oh, look at that magnesium and let's look at your amino acids and and things like that. And then, of course, looking at the stool to um, making sure that digestion absorption are optimal, things like that. So moving right along, I actually included this patient's thyroid labs. Um, I know this isn't like a thyroid specific presentation, but something that we can't miss as um, providers is you know, not only is if they're on thyroid medication or have a known diagnosis of hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, not that their levels are normal, but optimal. And so this patient, if you look at the TSH, it obviously looks like it's in range, right? To most doctors and providers. Um, so this is why I check a full thyroid panel, free T4, eh, lower end of normal, much lower than I like to see it. Um, and then of course, you know, she wasn't converting to the free T3, the active form of thyroid hormone. I'm like, no wonder you have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. And this could also be a contributor to the miscarriages, even though she was on a low dose of Synthroid. So we optimized that via medication. Um, and I kind of talked about the protocol, but basically we implemented a gut healing protocol. Um, I addressed digestion and dysbiosis. Um, there are some markers on the NutriVal that show that dysbiosis, fungal pattern overgrowth. And so you know, we worked on all of that. We fixed your constipation, focused on opening up detox pathways, 
Um, she had a lot of stress, wasn't sleeping. So we focused on that, you know, circadian rhythm, parasympathetic nervous system. We replenished a lot of nutrients via supplements. And of course, nutritional protocol and put her on an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and then of course, like I alluded to, we optimized other markers on her blood work, such as iron. She was super, well, I wouldn't say super. She was borderline anemic, um, had a suboptimal thyroid and then her vitamin D, I think it was, and I don't have it on here. I want to say it was like 26 or something. So, um, that can affect fertility and immune system and mood and all of that. And so those are kind of some of the things that we did for her. I know that we're almost done. We don't have a ton of time for questions, but, um, Lenore, I'll kind of turn it all over to you, but thank you all for being here and for listening and tuning in. And this is something that I hope, you know, we as clinicians can become more knowledgeable about, especially when patients come to us with recurrent miscarriages or unexplained infertility. And um, I know that we have amazing reproductive technology and we can't forget about all these essential aspects that will contribute to not only mom's health, like with the nutrition and the supplementation, um, but it'll also contribute to a healthy pregnancy um, postpartum, but also baby's health. So thank y'all so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. That was such a great presentation. Um, I think what made this presentation so exciting is that, you know, I'm in the same boat as you are. You know, we're expecting mamas here. I'm a little bit further than you are, as we discussed earlier, but um, we did receive quite a few clinical questions. And so let's go ahead and start with this one question. Um, they asked about um, the use of greens powders. Um, they asked if you sometimes will use that preconception as well as during pregnancy and or breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to green powders, I think there are a lot of different ones on the market. Is there anything in spe like specifically or I guess they just that's wanted to know if it was safe. Yeah, I would say, you know, always check the ingredients and see if they're safe. Of course, you have to be careful with certain herbs during pregnancy. I think, you know, prior to conception, um, there's no harm in supplementing with green powders and, you know, emphasizing that nutrient intake via that. Um, but you do have to be a little bit careful once once mom is pregnant because it contains some herbs or, you know, I've even seen some um, green powders that have like adaptogenic herbs and, uh, you know, things that are healthy to support healthy hormone production, but that I don't recommend during pregnancy uh, myself. Understand. Um, in regards to the preconception time frame, uh, you mentioned that two of the most common reasons that we can have fertility problems are PCOS and endometriosis. So during that preconception time frame, how do you shift your treatment protocol to um, accommodate for those who have number one PCOS and number two, those who may have endometriosis? Yeah, that's a really great question. So. Of course, I start with nutrition. Um, I have had a lot of endometriosis patients come to me that have done the laparoscopies, the interventions. Doctors are recommending to put them into menopause. I mean, all sorts of things. They've done tons of interventions, but they haven't changed their diet. They haven't cleaned up their environment. Um, and so I always, you know, there can be a lot of estrogen dominance and toxicity in some of these endometriosis patients. And I know that because I check, <laughs> um, but so really just, you know, when it comes to endometriosis specifically, really reducing overall total body inflammation via nutrition environment. And also I'm probably a little bit more aggressive with um, anti-inflammatory, you know, supplementation for those specific patients. And then with PCOS, you know, really working on, depending on what their labs or symptoms are, you know, of course I'll do hormone testing. Sometimes it's a matter of putting them on herbs to help them, you know, get their period back while balancing blood sugar, really focusing on stress for some of those PCOS patients. Um, you know, kind of some PCOS patients, I'll put them on adrenal type protocols, you know, eating, fasting, I don't think it's good for those type patients. You know, I want them to be balancing their blood sugar and, and eating the right amount of macro and micronutrients. Um, but of course, putting them on things specifically to help support healthy um, hormone cycles. Amazing. Um, I hope that all of those who attended this presentation has as many notes written down as I do. I hope that those <laughs> who have attended this presentation have enjoyed this thoroughly. 
Um, this has been just a great presentation in which we have a lot of key pointers, some great knowledge, some great slides to refer back to in regards to how to select a good quality prenatal and what to do during the preconception timeframe. So in the interest of time, we're going to end our um, Q&A section there. And so I just want to remind everybody that this presentation and the slides are going to be available within two, uh, within a few days on our website under Live GDX um, archives. And you can also, of course, on our website, access additional educational materials. And if you have additional questions or are interested in setting up a MyGDX account, please either call customer service or visit our website at www.gdx.net. Um, as many of you know, we do offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialists where we can help answer any question you may have related to testing or choosing the right test for um, your patients. So we'd like to, again, encourage everybody to register for the upcoming webinars on our website. And lastly, if you have not already done so, we have an amazing podcast with Genova Diagnostics called The Lab Report. And so it really focuses on functional and integrative medicine, special specialty laboratory diagnostics, and natural therapeutics. And the hosts are none other than Dr. Patty and Dr. Michael. And there is an assortment of wonderful guests. Um, so again, I want to thank um, Taylor for just a wonderful presentation and just looking at the feedback we've already received. We see great presentation, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. The slide's amazing. So just thank you so much, Taylor. This has been amazing. Thank you for having me. I was honored to be a part of it. Absolutely. Well, everybody have a wonderful day.